watching The 7 from WATE 6 on your side. Good evening, I'm Bo Williams, and welcome to The 7. Let's get a look at the Big 7 stories for you right now. Topping the list for us tonight, a revived Hurricane Ian made landfall on coastal South Carolina earlier today. You're looking at video of streets underwater in downtown Charleston. Now, the U.S. National Hurricane Center says Ian Center came ashore near Georgetown, South Carolina, right around 2.15 this afternoon with much weaker winds than when it slammed into Florida's Gulf Coast on Wednesday. Still... South Carolina seeing sheets of rain, downed trees, and power lines on top of the flooding. Also tonight, according to ABC, at least 21 people have now been confirmed dead in the U.S. from Ian. Meanwhile, in Florida, thousands still in need of rescue. Northport City officials tell our sister station, WFLA out of Tampa, the water levels are expected to continue rising for the next 24 to 36 hours. Several streets are still underwater. People are joining forces, though, using boats, kayaks, canoes. To rescue loved ones and strangers from their homes. Meanwhile, city leaders urging residents to stay put, and they have issued a curfew beginning at 8 p.m., ending at 6 the following morning. Now, we do want to take a moment and turn to Chief Meteorologist Ken Weathers in the Storm Center. Ken, I know you've been tracking this for us really all week, really, but yeah. where does Ian stand now, and are we going to see any impacts? We will have some impacts, Bo, but not as much as what it looked like at the beginning of the week because it has shifted further to the east, and because of that, our rain amounts will be drastically cut across the area. Already seeing some rain up towards the Tri-Cities right now, but dry for everybody else. The center of circulation continues to make its way up through South Carolina, almost into North Carolina. You can see the bands of rain kind of rotating around this, but again, because the center of circulation Circulation is so far east, that's where the heavier rainfall will be. So you can see across our area, there will be a sharp cutoff of the haves and have nots of rain. And our best chance really is overnight tonight into tomorrow morning. You can see back across portions of the plateau, we may not see any rain at all, while areas up towards the Tri Cities could see some one to two inch totals. Talk about the rest of the weekend forecast in just a minute, Bill. All right, Ken, check back with you. Next on our Big 7 list for you tonight, many people in our area are trying to find ways to help hurricane victims, including Elizabeth Dressel. She lives in Knoxville now, but is from Cape Coral, Florida. Elizabeth and her mom moved to Tennessee right after Hurricane Charlie in 2004. Right now, she has family and friends who've been impacted by the storm and is heading down to Florida to try and help them as much as she can, even though contact, we understand, has been very limited. So I've not been able to talk to them very much because cell service is really bad. My sister lives on Pine Island, um, which they've been talking about Matt Lachey and Pine Island on the news a little bit. Um, and she's actually stuck on the island because the road that leads to the bridge um, has actually completely collapsed and washed out. Elizabeth's plan is to drive down Monday. She has a trailer that she is trying to fill with supplies. So if anyone would like to donate, she is asking for water, flashlights, gas cans. But all the items she's collecting will actually be distributed through the fire department that her brother works for in Florida. And we'll have Elizabeth's contact information for you at WAT.com if you'd like to help out. And another way that you can help with hurricane relief, our parent company is teaming up with the American Red Cross to help those impacted by Ian. If you'd like to donate to the cause, it's very simple. Just take your phone, hold up your phone, scan the QR code you see right there in the middle of your screen. Another option for you is you can also text Red Cross to 90999. Next on the 7 for you, the city wants to make Knoxville more walkable. The effort comes after they completed a study to get a clear direction for sidewalk infrastructure. And sidewalks near schools was the top of the list of priorities, and for good reason. Unintentional pedestrian injuries are the fifth leading cause of death for children ages 5 to 19. This according to Safe Kids Worldwide. At even 25 miles an hour, if you hit a small child, they're going to have a very serious injury, and they might even die. Um, at 30 miles an hour, it's close to 50%. Fatality right. The city looks very strategically at places where uh, there are gaps in the existing sidewalk system, and especially with a with a view of uh, school school areas, uh, especially small children, elementary schools. Every year, an average of over 67,000 child pedestrians are injured. It's why the city of Knoxville is working to improve the way everyone can get around. In the past five months, two links to a sidewalk area near Bell Morris and Pleasant Ridge Elementary Schools have been added. It was a $1.7 million investment, but one the city believes is needed. 
Continuing our Big 7 coverage for you, Knoxville police are hoping now you can help in an ongoing shooting investigation. This after a man was injured at a gas station last night. The shooting happened at the Magnolia Mart on Magnolia Avenue, and police tell us when they arrived at the scene, they found a man with a gunshot wound in the leg and a tourniquet wrapped around it. Now, the victim told officers that he was pumping gas when he was shot by an unidentified man. At this time, the shooting is not believed to be random, but police need your help to name a suspect. And if you know anything that can help out here, you are asked to call East Tennessee Valley Crime Stoppers. Maybe you saw something. Call the number on your screen, 865-215-7165. In our next Big 7 story tonight, we now have two updates to two stories that we told you about yesterday. The first, Knoxville police say a 16-year-old boy who was detained yesterday for a shooting at Big Oaks Apartments is now a suspect. KPD says the minor is charged for possession of a firearm by a juvenile. We are told more charges from the shooting are pending. Of course, we will keep you updated as we learn more. Plus, a Loudoun County man is now officially facing first-degree murder charges after police say he stabbed his roommate to death. This happened off Old Lee Highway. The man you see here, 20-year-old Eric Santano, called 911 to report that he had stabbed another man. Deputies found 52-year-old Daniel Cisneros, who were told was Santano's roommate, dead with several stab wounds. At the time, Santano was detained for questioning. Now the Loudoun County Sheriff's Office has charged him with first-degree murder. He is being held on a $1 million bond. Next on the 7, we are now one step closer to trial for one of the three family members accused in a, in a shocking murder case. Michael Gray Jr. was in a Knox County courtroom this morning. His attorneys firmed up plans for his trial, setting his date now for February 13th. Back in August, he was allowed out of jail on bond ahead of the trial. He's accused of murder and child neglect charges. His parents, Michael Sr. and Shirley Gray, are, face, are both facing charges uh, in Roan and Knox counties in connection with the deaths of two of their adopted children. In May 2020, investigators found remains of their adopted daughter at their home in Roan County. A few days later, another adopted child was found buried at a home in Knox County that was previously owned by Gray Jr. You may recall that last year, a judge allowed Gray's case to be separated from his parents. Of course, we'll keep following these cases for you. Next up, there's a new opportunity for UT athletes and local organizations. The Volunteer Legacy has teamed up with the Emerald Youth Foundation and East Tennessee Children's Hospital as they are looking now to have a big impact across the state of Tennessee. Uh, leaders of the program say that since some of the student athletes at UT grew up in neighborhoods similar to their kids, they relate well together and they can be more natural with each other. What I see in our athletes early on is, you know, as you take, you know, name image likeness and the opportunities that have come to them. And I see, you know, sometimes they're really forced out of their comfort zone um, in certain things that they're doing to pro promote businesses and things like that. But man, when they're around kids, I just noticed that it's just a very natural fit. And I think they actually enjoy the quote unquote work that they do with children that look up to them. Volunteer Legacy is looking for more partners, whether you are an individual or an organization. You can learn more about the Volunteer Legacy by heading over to our website, wate.com. In other fall sporting news, Tennessee baseball team hit the field this week for the start of the fall season. This year's lineup is going to look a little different with eight new starters this season. Uh, but the pitching staff pretty much back intact, including ace Chase Dolander. Last season, he was one of the most dominant pitchers in college baseball, finishing with a 10-0 record and a 2.39 earned run average. Dolander spent the summer here in Knoxville working on his off-speed pitches, and head coach Tony Vitello says you can see the hard work is paying off. Physically, he just looks different. If you guys, I don't know if you'll talk to him today or you'll see him today, but Google a picture from his freshman year or some video, and he just looks like a completely guy, different guy physically. Um, so he looks great there, and in the bullpen, you can see the off-speed pitches are more crisp. Um, there's more shape to them. MLB Pipeline has Dolander, listen to this, listed as the second best college prospect in the country for next season. Well, a Boy Scout troop stolen trailer has now been recovered, and three people were arrested in connection to his disappearance. As we told you earlier this month, a trailer filled with expensive camping supplies was taken from the parking lot of First Baptist Church in Oak Ridge. In addition to the monetary loss, Boy Scout Troop 129 told us they felt like they were losing memories and opportunities for future trips. 
Shortly after the trailer was reported missing, a trailer that matched its description was spotted without a tag in Union County. Now, we're told officers pulled over the driver, Brian Cumbie, and found out his license was suspended. Inside the vehicle, officers found what a passenger confirmed was meth, along with a pipe, spoon, syringes, and other paraphernalia. Officers later determined the trailer belonged to Troop 129. Now, all three people in the vehicle listed on your screen were taken into custody and faced drug and theft charges. Well, believe it or not, tomorrow is October 1st, marking the first day of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Uh, all month long, the McNabb Center will be raising awareness about the impact of domestic violence in the community. Domestic violence can affect really anyone, regardless of age, sex, race, nationality, or ability. In 2021, the McNabb Center answered approximately 1,500 domestic violence crisis hotline calls. They will be available to discuss signs, types of abuse, and as always, they will be available to help out anyone in distress. Now, for more information, you can visit the McNabb Center Facebook page. A celebration of East Tennessee's LGBTQ community will kick off in downtown Knoxville. Matter of fact, it kicked off just a few minutes ago. Knox Pride Fest will begin with the Pride Parade down Gay Street. That started right at the top of the hour at 7 o'clock. That is only the beginning of this weekend's festivities. Tomorrow, celebration moves to World's Fair Park for day one of Pride Fest. The festival will be open from noon to 8 p.m. with several local vendors and performers providing food and entertainment. The celebration will then conclude on Sunday from noon to 4. Organizers call the event, quote, three days of equality, community, family, and fun. And with the festival taking place downtown Knoxville this weekend, you need to watch out for road closures. Now, tonight, Parts of Howard Baker Jr. Avenue are going to be closed. That's going to go until 9 o'clock tonight. This is for the parade. During the festival tomorrow and Sunday, World's Fair Park Drive between Grand and Clinch Avenues will be closed, along with the Clinch Avenue Bridge between World's Fair Park Drive and Henley. And speaking of road closures, you'll need to be aware of one in Sevierville as well. There will be a partial road closure for Douglas Dam Road. Sevierville police say this is because of a special event. They didn't give a whole lot of details. Uh, the closure will start today. It takes place all weekend long from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. along Old Douglas Dam Road between Highway 66 and the Mall Access Road next to PetSmart. Knoxville's going back in time. Dinosaurs will be roaming the Knoxville Convention Center this weekend for Jurassic Quest. Now, coming up September 30th through, or just today, through October 2nd, amateur paleontologists of all ages will be able to check out the more than 100 life-size animatronic dinosaur replicas. Plus, there are dinosaur-themed rides, live dino shows, and interactive science and art activities. Again, Jurassic Quest starts today and goes through Sunday at the Knoxville Convention Center. Tickets are now on sale for $19 per person. Just head to JurassicQuest.com. And October is just a day away, and dog parents had been uh, getting their costumes ready. Halloween, that's H-O-W-L, is returning to UT Gardens. Uh, the event caters to dogs and dog lovers and will be held Sunday, October 23rd from 1 to 5. You can enjoy a costume pet parade emceed by Aaron Donovan. The costume contest will be judged in categories like Bad to the Bone for the Scariest, Funny Bone for the Funniest, and More Halloween is free to attend. Uh, but parade, pre-registration, by the way, is $10 per costume, so you want to take part. Parade, by the way, will begin at 2.30. Again, that's coming up later in the month. Hey, the overall impacts from the remnants of Ian are going to be pretty low for the area. But I'll tell you what we can expect through the weekend when we come back.